Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast, Faithful and for the Faithful. I'm David Staples of the M. Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Well, one point is better than no points. How about that? Yep. Um, the Oilers uh, lost in overtime to the Chicago Blackhawks, the final score being 4-3. to three. And um, the Oilers kept coming back in the game, but they, they came up short in the end, and they they lost in in overtime. But um, it, it was a game, Bruce, where, they, where I thought, it just seemed like they were doing everything possible they could do to lose that game. And yet they got a point out of it. So I was, I was okay with that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this was, Chicago had the more jump of the two teams they hadn't played since uh, uh, Sunday. Of course, Edmonton played Saturday, Sunday, then Tuesday, and then tonight, and of course, all in different cities. And you could see Chicago was up for the game. It meant a lot to them. And uh, they just uh, had it going on. They were winning puck battles. They were, you know, they didn't play a great game, but they were ready, willing, and able to jump on Edmonton mistakes, of which there were many. And they, you know, the Hawks just uh, thought they, you know, they deserved the win on the night. So they did. I'm not too, I'm not pleased, but I'm not, you know, Actually, my good thing. I'll roll right in my good thing. My good thing. Well, just, just got wait, one point out of that game. Yeah, that's your. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that is like, a good thing. Uh, yeah, and if they were, they were <clears throat> swimming against the current all night. They gave in the first goal. They tied it. They gave in the second goal. They tied it, and then they just gave in this killer goal early in the third, and it looked like it was going to be three-two the whole way out. And Jack Michaels is saying. Lots of time left with 13 minutes left. And I said to my wife, every time Jack says lots of time left, the time just melts away. And it proceeded to do exactly that. There was barely any whistles. And the puck was just going up and down. It was like watching ping pong back and forth. and just, But nothing happening. And then out of the blue, Edmonton's six-on-five unit finally, finally connects with uh, 50 seconds to play, they got a bit of a lucky bounce, but you know, sometimes that's what it takes. If you remember early in the old road trip when Leon Dreisaitl hammered a one-timer off the goal post with the goalie out, that time they didn't get the bounce. Tonight they did. And they did with, you know, possession and sort of getting the puck to the net. And uh, uh, Evander Kane's uh, attempted pass was deflected by Seth Jones, whose stick was in the damn way all night long. But tonight he tipped it past his own goalie, Mark andre Fleury, and that was enough to uh, to coast to the finish line with the tie score. And uh, so sometimes you got to take it. They said it on the broadcast, and this is correct. I mentioned this on a podcast not long ago. The Oilers hadn't scored six on five all year. Uh, they haven't scored a tying goal six on five for at least two years. Because last year they got, I think, two six-on-five goals, and they were both, you know, they were down by two. They made it a one-goal game, a little bit exciting, but in the end, no value to the goal. This goal is worth one point. Huge. uh, With a chance for a second point. Like, literally, a tying goal is worth 1.5 points on balance. And tonight, the point five was uh, frittered away when uh, Leon Dreisaitl took a penalty in overtime, and the Oilers couldn't really come close to killing it. I, I'm superstitious enough, superstitious enough that when Jack Michaels talks about, like when the game's tied in the third, and he's talking about if the Oilers win this, they could be mm-hmm. second in the standings. I always feel like you're counting your points before they're, you're counting your chickens before they're hatched. You're counting your points mm-hmm. before you have them here. And it always like, ah, oh, I just don't, don't do that. Like, I feel like we're getting ahead of ourselves here. And especially in this game where they were constantly shooting themselves in the foot. Um, on that on that goal though, Kane's goal, I want to point out an outstanding play by Leon Dreisaitl. Um After the after the faceoff, it goes in the Chicago corner, and Chicago tries to clear it out. And I think it's actually a Chicago player who blocks Seth the Jones. clearing clearing oh. attempt, and it goes to Dreisaitl. But then Dreisaitl <laughs> puck protects along the boards, and he's got three Blackhawks on his back, three Blackhawks converging. And he fends them off, and it looks to me like he gets... He might have been kind of knocked off his stick, but I thought he actually made the pass back to the point with three different Blackhawks coming in on him. And that set set off the virtuous cycle, which, uh, you know, goes to Nurse, who does a nice job of puck protecting, 
at the blue line, puts it over to Bouchard, Bouchard to McDavid, McDavid to Kane, and into the net off Jones. So, But it was all started by Leon's fantastic play on the boards. That's not my good thing. My good thing is another Leon Dreisaitl play from earlier in the game. He and a, a Connor McDavid play. And a Zach Hyman play. It's the Oilers' first goal, power play goal. And it tied it up. You know, the Oilers got down one one nothing, and we're all... We've seen this movie before. Yeah. And half expecting, though, the Oilers can come back and tie it, and they did um, fairly fairly soon in the first period. It was a fantastic goal, power play goal. Connor McDavid's got the puck, and he's swooping up from behind the net towards his own blue line. And um, just as he's reaching the kind of the apex of his turn there, he passes it against the flow of play back to Dreisaitl, who's down way down low in his one-timer spot, which I, you know, I, I'm going to say, Bruce, is the lowest and farthest away from the net one-timer spot of anyone in the NHL, his, and of anyone in NHL history. He sets up lower down and further away than than uh, anyone. And this is the fact he can score from there is his secret sauce, his secret, secret success. Anyway, McDavid passed it against the flow of play, back to, to Dreisaitl, and Hyman's setting a screen in front of the net. And just as McDavid's making that pass, Flurry's peek at his head on the wrong side of Zach Hyman, which is like yeah. exactly what you want to see. You know, the goalie trying to look around the screen and looking at the <laughs> – that's it, Bruce. Looking at the wrong side. And because he's doing that, that way, Oops. When, he, when he went back to Dreisaitl and boom, the executioner shot where he lashes the stick yeah. at the net and, and pounds that puck in the net. Great goal by the Oilers. Great play. And I, I, you could, I just never get tired of seeing that. One thing I liked about that goal, which was a bit of a new wrinkle, was that as McDavid was coming out of the corner with the puck, uh, he made just a sort of short 10-foot pass to Leon. And I, I am probably 95% of oil country are going, shoot, because they've had the whole power play. And I don't think they had even one shot to that point. And Leon just did the wall pass back to McDavid, and he carried on into the slot. And it was like the whole Chicago team forgot about Leon after he touched the puck, and they started following McDavid. And Leon just kind of hung around where he was and got that stick cocked and ready and uh, bang and into the net with it. But that, that little give and go, that was a nice little trick. And the other key to that, real key to that, was McDavid moving his feet on the power. Oh, play. yeah, he really did tonight, didn't he? this before. At the, uh, when they were first trying to spring this power play to be the powerful weapon that it became was David skating in the zone with the puck rather than they used to have him nailed to the half wall. And once they kind of freed him from that, you, you started seeing plays like this. And it's nice to see one executed because, you know, the power play, the penalty kill is set up more against kind of set plays and stuff. And when you get a wild card like Connor McDavid just sort of doing skating rings around you on the ice, it's pretty easy to get discombobulated, as Chicago did there. I, th I felt good about the Oilers' power play tonight. As soon as I saw the Blackhawks were going to sit back in the box, like in, in their diamond or triangle or their box, that mm -hmm. does not work against the Oilers. The, the thing to do against the Oilers on the penalty kill is to come after them and harass mm -hmm. them. And uh, when Chicago didn't do that, when I could see they were going to be fairly passive, <laughs> I thought, oh, this this could work out well. And and it did right then. Yeah, McDavid Bruce, right from the start of the Oilers power play. Um, since McDavid's been on the team, we have been talking about that, you know, the where he's got to move, you know. He, he's just got to be on the move to make his plays. And the second they, they did figure, it was under McClellan that they initially figured that out. Maybe even Woodcroft was there um, when they figured that out. And um, it's been a, a, a staple of the Gullitson uh, power play mm -hmm. yes. with McDavid. They've continued to use that. He's always been on the move, and he was there tonight. Bruce, what is your bad thing? Well, it's got to be that first Chicago goal, and it came all of two minutes and 34 seconds into the first period. Stop me if you've seen this movie before. Actually, don't stop me. The podcast will be over right now. We've seen this movie way too many times. And it was just a brutal sequence by Edmonton. It was even just two and a half minutes of the game, already had their fourth line and seventh defenseman on the ice against Chicago's fourth line. And yet it was just a big cluster uh, in Edmonton territory. With The, the Oilers had a, a 
clear chance to to get the puck out. Colton Sevier on the left wing boards, puck came to him, and but on his backhand side, so he's got no strength to pass it up. Kyler Yamamoto decides now is a good time to blow the zone just in case uh, Colton Sevier magically metamorphoses into Leon Drysaddle and he can make a 100-foot backhand pass, aerial pass, and hit me for a breakaway. So he blew the zone. So now it's a, basically a Chicago power play because Yamamoto's gone. And, of course, Sevier, he has plenty of options uh, on his forehand, but that would involve passing the puck back. Like, he had Barry wide open on the other side. All he had to do was thump it off the backboard softly, and Barry probably could have walked it out. But instead, he tries to go up the boards with a direct giveaway. Uh, that established uh, Chicago possession. Uh, it comes over into the other corner, and the one defenseman... Tyson uh, Barry... Barry yeah, yeah, Barry is Barry is on the guy along the boards, and for whatever reason, Marcus Niemelainen decides he should leave his post in front of the net and come all the way over to the same boards where Barry is. Gets there late. Chicago cycles the puck. Uh, Sevier loses another battle in the slot. They slide the puck through, and there's a guy alone in front where Marcus Niemelainen used to be, and needs to be. I mean, he just that was a terrible play by him. It was a terrible play by three or four. Different Oilers there, you know, missed well, assignments yeah. and lousy execution. And that is a bad combination. The guy who scored actually was the guy that Tyson Berry had been battling on the boards. Mm-hmm. And then that guy went to the net. Right. And Tyson Berry did not. Mm-hmm. So no, there's you're no right. Oiler within 50 <laughs> feet of the guy. Two, two demon in the corner, <laughs> in the same corner. That's always a recipe for not good. And, and then to have. Both of them, like Nima Linen allows the pass in, and then Barry doesn't follow follow the guy who gets the pass. It was a nightmare. And Sevier, Sevier makes mistakes at the front end of the power play and at the back, or front end of the goal against, oh and God. at the, the back end of this particular sequence of pain. And it really was a bad one. It was it was horrendous. Bruce, my bad thing is is a much more extended sequence of pain. It was the entire second period in the first three minutes of the third. Um. Oh. After a really iffy first period, you'd think the orders are thinking, okay, we got to pull up our socks here, you know, sharpen our skates and get out there and move our feet, get moving out there and make some plays. But what what happens in the next 23 minutes, there's nine grade A shots and seven of them are, are for the Blackhawks. And uh, of those grade A shots, four of them were uh, uh, five alarm shots for the Blackhawks and just one for the Oilers. And that was on the power play. So um, the Oilers just got clocked, just wave after wave, uh, Blackhawk attackers, often, most often led by Patrick Kane, who was the best player on the ice, who was fantastic all night long, so dangerous. Um, and, it, and it started off, Bruce, with a, <laughs> or just this, like, uh, it was Bouchard, I think, he tries to, I just, what was this, he tries to get it out and he can, and then he, then he pass, tries to pass it back to Keith. And Keith misses the pass, goes under his stick, and then Chicago gets a near chance. They actually didn't put it on net on that one. And and then uh, then what follows again is, as I've said, just these endless waves. That Koskinen, to his credit, he's pl- he's playing great. He's zeroed in. He's making all the saves. And Chicago, despite all of that pressure, does not get a goal in the second period. And you're coming out for the third period. And uh, the score is tied. And I'm thinking, at that point, I'm thinking the Oilers are going to win. That um, this is the Oilers' time to take over the game. I, I'm again expecting them to, like, okay, first period, we screwed it up. Second period, we really screwed it up. Now we're going to get it right. <laughs> but then the the hero to the game, up until that point, Miko Koskinen just makes a horrendous turnover. He he passes it. <laughs> it's doubly horrendous because he passes it to a sniper, Dominic Kubalik. Um, up the boards, and Kubelik just ab, just fires it right in the net. Boy, he made no mistake. Man, did yeah. he bury that. And, of course, it's almost terrible. It, I feel bad almost talking about this and mentioning it, because you just know the player. You know the player. You know Koskinen and just, you know, he knows. Everyone, everyone knows. Everyone's looking at him. And he came back after that, and he, and he played well after that. But actually, after that, the Oilers started to play well. And they did, um, they did get the majority of the, they got all the rest of the grade A chances until the winning goal in overtime for Chicago. So, um, 
it was a horrendous stretch of play capped off by an absolutely utterly hideous uh, and rancid turnover by Miko Koskinen. That's hockey. Those things will happen. Hockey happens fast and mistakes happen fast. Uh, even f- for NHL hockey players. And I, I just really felt sorry for, for Koskinen, but it, it's not the first time he's made a bungle like that. He's It's not his strength, the old uh, passing of the puck. No, that, that one was inexplicable. Like, there was yeah. no, who was he passing it to? There was no <laughs> order within like 25 feet of where he put it. Kublik went to the boards, the order guy went in the middle, Koskinen, like, he looked the other way and he went behind his back and was right on, it didn't even reach the boards. It got to Kublik like he was passing it to him. And Kublik just went, thanks, wham! One-timer blast, top corner from an impossible angle. That really was a great shot, and that's why Koskinen couldn't get back in the net, but it was a gift. And it was it was so um, strange in the sense that Kublik was the guy that Koskinen flat out robbed twice in the second period on great passes from Patrick Kane where he just wired one timers on the net. Somehow Miko got kept both of those ones out and then he turns around and does that, right? Maybe boy, Kubelik, did it look like that was going to be the hockey game. Maybe Kubelik did the old thing like Kosk, you know, pass. <laughs> <laughs> the oh, really? play, you know, that that could happen. Why not? Um I'm sure it works now and then too. Uh, all right, Bruce, what's your number? Uh, I think just because I know he's probably taken all kinds of grief on the uh, Twitter sphere and our logosphere and radio collins and such, uh, I'll go with uh, Mikko Koskinen's numbers in his last 10 appearances. 10 appearances, nine, nine starts, seven wins, zero regulation losses, two overtime losses so a result in every game and a 925 uh save percentage and the goals against average is right around 2.40 and uh, for a you know a 10 game stretch and that dates all the way back to january 22nd when when uh oilers ended their and Koskin himself ended their long losing streak uh, with a huge win against Calgary that was a, strictly a goalie steal. And tonight, yeah, he didn't get the two points, and maybe if he didn't make that mistake, who knows? But, I mean, the Oilers wouldn't have pulled their goalie to try and win it either, would they have? And they wound up, at least the team got the goal back for him, and he appreciated it. He came all the way out to center for the for the goal celebration. The boys got him off the hook, and and uh, and that's what that's what you uh, you like to see. There's a there's a great quote in one of my favorite hockey books, The Leafs I Knew by Scott Young, father of Neil. And it, he, he he writes a bunch of game stories in the book. It's like a diary and it's from his columns, right? And he's quoting Punch Imlac behind the net, saying or behind the bench, saying to the Leafs, Your goalie is a horse is deleted for uh, letting in that goal and we this is a team. We don't want anybody on it to be a horse is deleted, so we gotta get that goal back. And of course, he had horses ass, but this was the 1960s where it couldn't even make it into a book. But uh, the quote was direct, and the Oilers did, or the Toronto Maple Leafs did get the goal back with a late tying goal, and uh, just just to get a tie back in those days. Of course, he didn't do any of this gimmick time stuff. And so I often think of that play when when a goalie makes a bad mistake in a, in a you know, especially in a tie game in the third period. It's nice to see the team rebound for him, but. Uh, I think Koskinen's playing good. Yeah, he made a brutal mistake there. But, I mean, you can't crucify every player every time they make one mistake. You know, I mean, if it's if it's a habitual series of mistakes, I'm not going to blame Koskinen for this loss. Let's put it this way. I think without him in there tonight, I'm not sure they got the point. I, I agree, Bruce. That's I think that's a real fair comment, that that he, he, he won them that point. And uh, they got a break at the end on a bounce, which is what they, you know, I think they did kind of deserve the one point because they kept coming back. And that's my story, and I'll stick to it. It's funny, you, you mentioned the word oilogosphere. It's not a word that you hear, like, be, no, it's before, possible. it's people don't talk about the oilogosphere. I mean, the oilogosphere was like a, it was a really interesting time. It, you know, it started in the 2006 playoffs when all these hockey blogs kind of popped up, popped up I think. I wasn't reading them then. I, I wasn't aware of this mm-hmm. at the time. Oh, I, the cult of hockey started... Um, 
I didn't know if there was any other Oilers blogs. It, it wow. started in the fall of 2007. Okay. And uh, after this, but there was all these existing blogs already, like uh, Low Tide, of course, which mm-hmm. is the, one of the surviving of, very few of these blogs have survived, but Low Tide is still going strong, obviously, stronger mm-hmm. than ever. Um, Copper and Blue, I think Copper and Blue was around then, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, you know, MC M- 79, MC 79 Hockey was around. The Reverend Oiler fans. The Reverend Oilers fans. Battle of Alberta. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a, that uh, was a hot any, one. Any of the other ones? Uh, yeah, what was the one? Covered in Oil? Covered that was in kind Oil? Of the, yeah, that was one that, the, that, that, the, from, that the, women, the women fans did that one, and I think it was it was uh, spicy. But I see, and there was a guy from... <laughs> I didn't... Uh, a guy I, from it Sudbury? It took me a while to get in there on the, on the blogosphere. There's a guy from Sudbury. He wrote one, too. Like, I um, can't remember. Is Mike, I think, is his name? Anyway, I can't remember. Oh right! Uh, I mean, there's oil on white. There, there's, uh, 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 yeah. Well, there's, there's lots there's... of blogs. There's still there's mm-hmm. all kinds of blogs now, still, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yes. um, back then, it was very novel. And anyway, the the name oil logosphere was coined yes. at that time, and uh, it was a big deal. It was a uh, it was an interesting mm-hmm. and very fruitful thing. A lot of research that had a huge influence on hockey Absolutely. came out of a group of blogs. Uh, Bruce, my number is six. And um, this was the number of, of Bakersfield Condors oh. on the team tonight. Mm-hmm. And it just struck me, that's a lot. Like, I know there's other years, if you look at the like the team roster, if you go over the whole year, you'll find, you know, six guys who played in the AHL or seven guys and also the NHL. But not often in six, not often in the same game. And not often, I think, in kind of, key roles often on this team it just there's a big bakersfield contingent here and they're contributing a lot so Mm -hmm. that starts with you know uh, evan bouchard and cutter yamamoto who both played more than 20 minutes tonight and Mm -hmm. uh, key players on this team ryan mcleod who's become a key player on this team 18 minutes and 30 seconds william loggison who i i'm I, i he's starting to play a very quietly effective game uh, he played 13 minutes tonight and was, and, and again, I'm impressed with him. He's, he's not flashy. He's not the big hitter that Nima Linen is, but uh, based on time on ice, he's moved ahead of Nima Linen on the depth chart. Nima Linen played nine minutes and he played 13. Mm-hmm. So, um, and Nima Linen struggled tonight. Loggison didn't. Yeah. Um, and then there was Brad Malone. Uh, this the center uh, who's just called up recently, the veteran center who played 920. And he's more of a, a classic kind of AHL call up, you know, a veteran player who's just filling in for probably a short amount of time. But Five uh, hits for Brad Malone. He uh, he plays a he plays a I like him. game. So you don't count uh, Sevier who went down there and came right back no, up again. Well, I don't count, I wasn't counting Sevier. Yeah, uh, well, no, tonight he uh, he may be headed out to Bakersfield again after that game. He uh, Two minutes and 47 seconds, minus two, and he was uh, part of the problem on both of those uh, uh, first two Chicago goals with I, um, I don't, yeah. bad mistakes, really. I was surprised to see him on the ice again, Bruce, after the first goal. Like, honestly, oh. it was like so, <laughs> that was, and again, it's just like, it's one play, it's a veteran player, and it's one, you know, and he made two mistakes, two big mistakes, but nonetheless, I was and I guess after two big mistakes, that was enough for the coaches. He didn't, I don't know how many shifts he got. Did he get three shifts, maybe? He, he got the Samarkov treatment. He got four shifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah four, four shifts. shifts in total. And I think they were all in the first period. I'm just... Uh... But nonetheless, these Bakerfields guys are a big part of the team. And there's going to be more of them. Philip Broberry is going to be a big part of this team. Uh, Raphael Lavoie and Stuart Skinner, who I didn't mention... Um, you know, he's, who's been up and down this year right. between the HL and the NHL. There's Tyler Benson, uh, who, who was, is he, I guess he's sick. It sounds like he's sick. Yeah. And, um, he was out and Sevier took his place and that wound up being that little tiny move wound up being yeah. costly. You never know, right? It's a weak link game, Bruce. You're, you're as strong as your weakest link in hockey because your weak link can cause a goal against, and that can be the difference in a game. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I think this is a, a really positive trend for the Oilers franchise. 
that um, they've promoted the coach from the AHL. The AHL is, is coach. The, the AHL team is a really good team and it's full of talent and it's been full of talent for a couple of years now, coached by this coach. And we're going to get a smooth and rational transition of these players um, with a coach who has confidence in them and knowledge of them uh, to the Edmonton Oilers. I think it's really huge for, for, for the Oilers franchise. And um, it's kind of, there's maybe kind of a secret superpower of what's going to go on in the next year um, with this team, because uh, it's something we haven't had in Edmonton since I think kind of like the early 2000s when there was a lot of graduating players from the AHL team. Right. We haven't had it since then, but we're having it now. And it's a, it's a hallmark of sound hockey teams and solid hockey management. And it started under Peter Shirelli and it's continued under Ken Holland, two GMs who have taken a lot of criticism for their pro hockey moves, oh. like their trades mm-hmm. and their signings. But they, they both have gotten this right. I think, to, you know, to give credit where it's due, um, they both got this right. Yeah, well, huge credit where it's due, I think, to uh, Keith Gretzky. Yeah. And also to um, Claude Woodcroft, Woodcroft uh, you know, Jay Woodcroft and uh, uh, and the assistant coaches down there. I mean, yesterday the Oilers signed three guys from Bakersfield uh, and today a, a fourth one. And... Uh, two of them were extensions on existing contracts. That was Dmitry Smorkov and uh, Seth Griffith. Uh, but the other two guys were guys that they signed to AHL contracts who were playing so good that they established themselves as being worth <coughs> giving them uh, an NHL <coughs> pact. We've seen this in the past with Mark uh, Arcabello and uh, Curry. Which Curry was that? It wasn't Yari? Josh. It wasn't Dan. To Josh Curry. Yeah, that's it. Josh Curry, uh, who wa- started on a minor league deal and eventually worked their way up into the NHL. Well, yesterday, order signed two guys like that, who they'd signed to minor league deals. Uh, Vince uh, DeHarnay, the gigantic, humongous defenseman, right shot defenseman, who's like plus twenty seven or something on on the season down there, and also James Hamblin, the a uh, local kid makes good from Southside Athletic Club who was uh, uh, played five years in the WHA. They signed him as an overager, good sharp signing, and he pressed me right away. As soon as I saw that guy, I thought, Jesus, this guy's pretty good for, you know, 21-year-old undrafted guy. He's, you know, he looks like a... And every time I see um, Bakersfield play, Hamlin catches my eye. And I was thinking, you know, both guys have a half decent chance of getting a contract. And then yesterday they both did. So to me, that's a it's Ken Holland and Keith Gretzky being on the same page, which is nice. And it's also, you know, a feather in the cap of Gretzky, of uh, Woodcroft, uh, that they're developing these players, even the lower level prospects, making them good enough to make them, you know, mid-level prospects. Like they're still long shots, but uh, they're long shots with a chance as of today. And uh, I really like to see that. Yeah, DeHarnay is having quite a season. He's 6'7", 230 pounds. And yeah. uh, he's got 18 points in 43 games, and he's plus 24. So um, Hamblin's a smaller player. He's listed at Hockey DB as 5'9", 180. But he's yeah. third in the team in goal scoring with 14 goals. And, uh, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, clearly, if he's going to be a pro player, he's going to be a role player. Mm-hmm. So he's going he's gonna to be working on those traits I guess I wonder if we'll see Luke Esposito get a pro con- well, NHL contract. Hey, yeah, he's. I mean, I he, like. I they like. sure have a lot of good pros there. I mean, that's the thing. They do. They, do, they really do. Whether on AHL or, or uh, NHL class contracts, that team is uh, has got a lot of uh, good players. Seth Griffith at that level is really good. So at minimum, what they've done with these set of signings has basically ensured that that uh, Bakersfield Condors are going to be a good team for a while. It's going to have internal competition. It's going to have internal leadership and experience. And the young guys that they send down there are going to have other players to play with and learn from. And, you know, it's it's just a healthy situation all the way around. Have they sent Broberry down yet? They have, have yes. they not? Yes. Okay, he's got, and he's got 19 points in 27 he play, games. He, he's played, he, scored, he played last night and he scored a goal. Yeah, he's... He's he's really thrived down there, and you know he seems tentative in Edmonton still. Um, yes. I think we'll see. I think he's going to make the team out of training camp, make mm-hmm. the orders out of training camp next year, probably. Okay. But um, 
here's a bonus number for us tonight, 17. And that is the number of NHL games for Philip Broberg. And it happens to be the exact number of games that uh, Oscar Kleffbaum played in his draft plus three year that he came over from Sweden. And the next year he made it into the NHL. So we've often compared those two. And thought that's kind of cool that he's just right on that number and they sent him out. So. There, there's similarities between the players. They're both um, big guys who can skate and move the puck. Not particularly physical, but can defend and mm-hmm. uh, can shoot the puck a bit. So... Um, Philip Robury is leading the power play down there for Bakersfield. Yes. He's a key guy in the power play. So it's been, a, a, I think, quite a good year for him, a good situation for him in in uh, in the bake. And uh, we'll see what comes next. All right, Bruce, the next game for the Oilers is on Saturday. Saturday night, Edmonton. 5 p.m. At, in Edmonton against uh, Montreal. Yet another one-game homestand for the Oilers, followed by yet another uh, trip to uh this time to Calgary. So I detailed in the in the game day post today that it's like a one long 14 game road trip for Jay Woodcroft. It's game number 14. So 13 and 14 or 14 and 15. That's the first time that the Oilers played two games in a row in Edmonton, where he keeps his team in one place and they might even be able to practice between games. It's just been just to, here, there, and everywhere. They stopped in Edmonton a couple times. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in the last 10 games, they played two home games and they were both singles. So it's just like a 10-game road trip in, in, a, in a sense of the itinerary that they've had to follow. And you could see some of the effects of that tonight, I think. The boys just didn't have a lot of jump. That's true. Um, so the Oilers are tied with Vegas right now in the standings. They both have uh, oh. 55 games. They got 64 points. Wow. So if, if you had said, someone said it going into the season, after 55 games, the Oilers will be tied with Vegas in the standings. Will you take that, Bruce McCready? You would have said? I would have said, depends how good Vegas is. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. If they're tied for first uh, place with them, I'm real happy with it. Of course, if someone had said after 55 games, your team would be behind the Los Angeles Kings, would you take yeah. that? Then you no. say, no, thank you. But uh, they are. And anyway, there's it's a real dogfight between yeah, um, these the Kings, the Oilers, and, and Vegas uh in this conference with Cal- calgary a cut above those teams a significant cut above honestly like i hate to say it i hate to admit it I mean, oh, yeah. but it's the truth and anaheim and vancouver kind of a step behind at this point and hopefully never catching up but we'll see we'll see what happens next all right bruce let's let's leave it there thanks for talking tonight all right thanks for listening everyone and in the meantime and in between times this has been another edition of the cult of hockey podcast.